St. Louis, a serial killer strikes and vanishes. Making little evidence of his break. Blending into the community, he confounds authorities for more than three decades. To catch him, the police must find his weakness and reveal the true face. November 3rd, 1977, two men drove up to an Illinois farmhouse. Sir, how are you this evening? Fine. Okay. You're Mr. Graham, right? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm Bob Beck, and I'm from well, the one I'm man from waited the in the farm car. Service. The other introduced We've himself as a representative of the farmers. Sure, come on in. Great. My pleasure. Alan Graham led him into his home. Outside of St. Louis Dental Lab. Ow! Oh. Law enforcement was beginning to suspect a murderer hey, might be a St. Louis dentist named Glennon Engelman. They believed he had killed several persons for the profit. But they had little to do with it. I'm sorry. I got the insurance money. They were trying to prove his involvement by speaking with his ex-wife, Rita. For two days, Rita relayed to investigators stories about the killings her ex-husband had confided to her. But Special Agent McGarvey encountered problems in building a case. The major problem we had was at the time the doctor, at the time Engelman was telling his wife this information, most of the information, it was during the time that they were married. So because of the mar marital privilege, almost all of that evidence was inadmissible in court. Hey. Hi, Bill. The agents needed prosecutable evidence guys. against the dentist. We just don't have enough right now on him to take him to trial. They had a plan, but it involved considerable risk to the suspect's ex-wife. So here's what we'd like to do. Now he visited her residence to visit the child at least twice a week sometimes three times a week, sometimes four times a week. So he would come over there on a regular occasion. They would still go out to dinner together. And uh, he was a part of the child's life. They needed to get Engelman's confessions on tape. There's no way. And to do that, they would no need way. to wire Rita's condominium with hidden microphones. There's no way. There is no way I can do yep. that. Hey, you don't know my husband. You don't know my ex-husband. He would kill me. Whenever Engelman came to visit, Investigators wanted Rita to bring up the murders to get him to talk about them. Rita told the agents that Glennon was already paranoid about his conversations being bugged. 
She feared he might find out. It seemed to her to be a risky proposition. But we explained to her that if we can get Dr. Engelman to admit to her again some of the things that he admitted to her in the past, that would serve two purposes. Number one, it would, it would give us the evidence that we would need, first-hand evidence from Dr. Engelman's mouth that he committed these murders. Number two, it would bolster her credibility as a witness. Rita knew the only way she and her son would ever be truly safe was if Glennon Engelman was behind bars. She agreed to cooperate. The agents began to wire her home for sound. Okay. McGarvey assured Rita that agents would be nearby in case of an emergency. He felt he should start with the bombing death of Susan Barnes. The most recent murder and was still in the news. Rita could then use the Barnes murder to bring up the other killer. McGarvey was asking Rita to put aside her fears of Engelman. People that are the closest to him, the people that know him the, the, the most, are the people that fear him the most. And the reason for that is that. You know, they're, they're aware of what his capabilities are. They're aware that he has no, no conscience about coming up behind somebody and shooting him in the back of the head, even though he's a friend of his. You know, he'll do that. And the people that are closest to him know that. And that's a lot of the way that he was able to control people. Investigators set up surveillance outside Rita's condominium. It was the evening of January 20th, 1980. Agents observed Engelman returning from an outing with his son. Listened in as Rita brought up the subject of Barnes' murder. Engelman said he had an airtight alibi. He reminded Rita that even if he had built the bomb, he could have had somebody else plant it. There was no mistaking the threat in Engelman's voice. Agents got a sense of how menacing their suspect was. He's very cagey. He was a very diabolical guy. And he talked, uh, he talked a lot about uh, the things that he would do to people. You know, it gave us some insight as to what type of a man that he was and what type of a person we were dealing with. With Barnes dead, Engelman indicated he was now $14,000 richer. They won a 30% court cost above it. The lawsuit would be dropped and he wouldn't have to pay attorney's fees. As the doctor continued, it sounded as if the transmission was breaking up. Fix it. Tweak it up. The agents heard an odd scratching sound. They realized it was the family dog calling at one of the transmitters. The agents feared it might dislodge the bug and undermine the discovery. That's what I know. had nearly been blown. No, not the same woman at all. That danger had passed, but Rita was still in jeopardy. <laughs> we were very much concerned about her safety the entire time she was in. She was at extreme risk, and that's not exaggerating. She was, uh, she was in there with a man that, uh, as we knew it at that time, killed people. And uh, we were very, very concerned about her safety. During the conversation, Engelman had been careful not to take credit for killing Susan Barnes, although he admitted being pleased she was dead. Rita told investigators that she and her ex-husband had made plans to go out for dinner. Put a, put a transmitter on you. Knowing her husband's fear, the feds may be bugging his conversations. She believed he might be more comfortable talking in a public place. Rita agreed to wear a wire to the restaurant. Okay, I think that's 
Engelman had given them little on the car bombing incident. To avoid raising the dentist's suspicions, the agents had to switch topics. They next focused their attention on his other publicized murder. They wanted to get Engelman talking about Ted Baker, who had been shot to death near a St. Louis museum two decades earlier. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. They were concerned the dentist might get suspicious if his ex-wife suddenly here, brought up a murder a that occurred so long ago. This one over here, that is a cavity, so we'll have him look at that. They came up with a plan to leak information about Baker's murder to the press. Get out of my office now! Doctor, can you answer a question for the truth? No, Two reporters and a photographer no. showed up at Engelman's office and attempted to get a statement from him. You get out. Special get out. Agent McGarvey continued to use the media to pressure their suspect. We made arrangements with them without, without, without telling them or going into detail about what we had, and they, they respected that. But they told us the information that they had, along with the information that we had. They agreed to print stories whenever we wanted stories printed about certain murders. The next morning, St. Louis residents woke up to learn the dentist was a suspected serial killer. England saw his name on the front page. Reporters were linking him to the Barnes bombing as well as to the murder of Ted Baker and the death of Ed Franklin with the drag strip. Now that would give Rita the opportunity to quiz Dr. Engelman on that particular murder without her having to bring it up out of the blue. No, it's okay. It's all right. Is that going on your leg at all? No, uh -uh. it's not going to show though, right, at all? That afternoon, investigators went to Rita's home and fitted her with a miniature transmitter. Agents set up electronic surveillance in a parking lot across from the restaurant. The newspaper trick appeared to work. Rita used the article to draw Engelman out about the murders. She asked him how he became such an explosive expert. Engelman replied that he learned from the best, a demolition powder expert from World War II. Engelman was losing the world. Investigators were encouraged. Engelman had acknowledged he was proficient with explosives. Okay, you did a really great job. Worrying. That was the weapon of choice in the Barnes and Franklin murders. But the dentist never admitted killing anyone. He had said nothing that would stand up in court. After thinking it over, Rita had an idea. She told investigators that she and her ex-husband were still intimate. In the bedroom. That's Engelman the often confided secrets to her in the bedroom, she said, on and on. after sex. <laughs> With her consent, technicians set to work bugging Rita's bed. As they worked, agents staked out Engelman's dental office. The doctor decided to leave work early. Somehow he slipped through their surveillance. Number one is back. By the time they spotted him in his car, it was nearly a greatest home. Their whole plan was not in vain. Federal agents were riding a beetle angle in the bedroom with hidden microphones. Their subject, Ron and Engelman, the suspected serial murderer, had somehow slipped their surveillance. An agent picked up the dentist's car and radioed the men in the house to get out.
final call for come just in time. Engelman had picked up a present for Brian and wanted to drop it off. Wow. Wow. Well, listen, I know you got things to do. So do I. So you get back to what you were doing. I just want to stop and surprise. Oh, you, it right? was quite a surprise. All right, well, enjoy it, kid. All right. Yeah, thanks. All right. Quite a surprise. Oh, good. Good. I'll see you later. Okay. We'll come back. After Engelman left, the agents went back to the Technicians hit a recorder inside the headboard and ran the microphone by the mattress. Okay. Okay. They also installed transmitters inside the light switches. Can you hear it when I come to Special Agent McGarvey assured Rita they would be stationed close by. Anything on that side of it? We also had a number of agents that were scattered throughout the entire apartment complex where she lived. Now we, you know, we had to be careful enough though he, so he wouldn't detect the surveillance. But we had to keep it tight enough that we can react in the event something, something happened within the house, uh, so we can get in there before uh, something occurred. Even with his agents so close, McGarvey knew Rita Engelman was still in danger. If the dentist were to discover that his ex-wife had betrayed him, that she had violated the sanctity of their bedroom, then Rita's life would be in jeopardy. No, it's done, it's done. No, wasting no, no time, Rita asked Engelman why he couldn't have settled with Susan Barnes differently outside of killing her. The dentist did just as Rita and the agents expected. He began to talk freely. Engelman replied that the woman deserved to die. But he maintained that he didn't kill her. You're just like some needle stuck in a groove. You keep when Rita continued to press him about the bombing, Engelman grew angry. Rita, I don't kill people. If everybody stand by, we all need to stand by. You might have a problem. That's right, you have them. He said he was beginning to feel that he was in a bugged room. You're my ex-wife, and you can testify. And he reminded her that she was not his wife any longer, that he could, she could testify in court against him. And in a very sinister voice, uh, he said, uh, and to be honest with you, Rita, that makes me a, a little edgy. He said he was now afraid the police were trying to get to him through her. He said the police may have even bugged the house without her knowing. To protect Rita, they might have to go into the house. As the agents began to mobilize, suddenly, Engelman calmed down. Everybody stand by. He's going, he's reaching the landing, he's opening the door. There he is. There he is. He's leaving. Rita had survived a close call, but McGarvey didn't want to take any chances. He's, he's leaving the premise, everybody stand down. I need everyone to stand up. He feared that Engelman was now suspicious of his ex-wife, and on the next visit, he might start searching for hidden microphones. He had wired that condominium with a bunch of uh, sound systems, and he was a pretty handy guy electrically. So he was aware of all the wiring in the house, and he mentioned that to her, that uh, he knows every wire in every corner of the house, and uh, just to let her know that, that if she was, in fact, wired or taping him, he was going to find out. The agents, fearing for Rita's safety, decided to pull the listening devices out of her apartment. Do you, do you realize? It was too risky for the two of them to be alone. And then without ever even suggesting to Rita continued to work with the agents to ensure that she and her son would be safe from her ex-husband. She spent hours with investigators transcribing the tapes, looking for that one piece of evidence that would put the dentist in jail. As they pored over the transcripts, the agents felt they needed more. Engelman had never admitted any right guilt to Rita. Okay. With Engelman growing suspicious, McGarvey knew they were running out of time. But he had one last card to play. Again, agents leaked information to the press. The newspaper ran another story linking Engelman to a fourth unsolved murder. This time, 
It was the 1976 shooting of Paul Henderson at the quarry. He knew Engelman was reticent about talking at Rita's place, and it was too dangerous for she and Engelman to be alone. So Rita called the dentist and got him to invite her out to dinner for Valentine's Day. Dr. Engelman was a lot more at ease talking outside of the house because he always felt that the feds were, uh, were bugging his house anyway. Discussing the newspaper article about the Henderson murder, Rita asked Engelman if the victim's wife, Maria Montoya Henderson, got a lot of money. Feeling secure in a public place, the dentist began to talk. Engelman said he received the cash from Maria's brother, Jose. Rita wondered if Jose may have skimmed some of the insurance settlement for himself, but Engelman thought Jose wouldn't dare. He said Jose was aware that he and Carpenter like had access to a hitman. Someone who did simple killings for a thousand bucks. During the course of, of, of taping these, we had Rita ask him, you know, what the purpose of all these scams were. And, and Engelman would tell her well, the purpose was for money. Money, money, money. Rita expressed concern that Maria might talk. With all the publicity, she was worried about the woman's mental stability. Dr. Engelman was certain that Maria would never talk. He said they shared a bond stronger than sexual intimacy. Engelman believed Maria would never reveal their secret. They had been, in his words, homicidally intimate. Agents suspected this meant that two of them had conspired to murder Paul Henderson. It was the admission of guilt they had been waiting for. For months, investigators have been collecting evidence linking Dr. Glennon Engelman to a series of murders. Fearful that it was too dangerous to continue taping his conversations, they wanted to see if they had enough to prosecute. To determine whether they had a case, Special Agent McGarvey played the tapes of Engelman's conversations for State Prosecutor Gordon Hankman. There's no doubt, when you listen to this man talk about the homicidal intimacy of killing people, that this is not someone that you, you want out on the street. Background noise made it difficult to hear some of the words. Referring to the transcripts, Ankney focused on a key passage. Engelman was telling Rita he had no driving urgency to get rid of his fellow man. As we went through that area, we looked at it thinking, well, that, that's he's saying he didn't do it. And we thought, well, wow, this doesn't help us because right in the middle of all this, he's saying he has no urge to kill people. But we heard something in there that there was another word in there. We went back and we listened. We probably even get this tape cleaned up. As they replayed the tape, they heard a word the transcriptionist had missed. Engelman was in fact saying he had no driving urgency to keep getting rid of his fellow man. I have no driving urgency. The conversations pointed to Engelman's guilt. Prosecutors felt their strongest case against Dr. Engelman was the shooting death of Paul Henderson at the quarry. It was the only homicide the dentist had admitted taking part in. Although the evidence was weak, prosecutors felt they had to act immediately. And they knew it wasn't safe for their key witness to stay in St. Louis. Rita Engelman and her son were given new identities and placed in the Federal Witness Relocation Program. They would begin a new life in a distant city. The tapes were powerful, but by themselves, they would not be enough to convict Engelman. To make a convincing case, they would need direct evidence the testimony of Engelman's accomplices. We had to do something, but we needed a witness. And so it was our belief that if we had them all arrested, we could tell them that the doc is, is in jail and under arrest. They didn't have to fear him. Because Engelman's conspirators did not actually approve the trigger, investigators felt they might get one of them to talk. Police acquired arrest warrants. Engelman three persons mentioned in connection with the murders in the tapes. Bill Carpenter, Jose Montoya, and his sister Maria. Our uh, strategy was to uh, 
arrest all four of them uh, simultaneously. Uh, our reasoning was to keep them separated so they couldn't talk to one another or couldn't call one another and arrest them all at the same time on a specific date. If any one of the suspects heard about the other's arrest, they could run and the case might be lost. arrested Dr. Engelman for the capital murder of Paul Henderson at the quarry. Bill Carpenter, Engelman's closest friend, was arrested at his home. Rita had implicated him in several of the murders. John McGrady questioned Carpenter later in jail. He's being arrested at the very moment. When we told him that uh, Engelman was served with a capital murder warrant, I thought he was going to pass out. I mean, he really, it's just it, like somebody hit him in the head with a ton of bricks. I mean, he, and, and then all of a sudden he wanted to, wanted to clam up. So I don't know anything about it. With Carpenter refusing to talk, investigators pinned their hopes on Jose Montoya and his sister. Police, come out here, step out, hands on the wall right now. Unless they could get one of them to cooperate, they wouldn't have much of a case. As they drove to the station, Jose heard on the police radio that they were looking for his sister. In California, Maria's last known address, police reported they were unable to locate her. California, huh? Yep. That's amazing. She's not there, though. What are you talking about? She's at my house. You just left her back there. To ensure Maria didn't get away, they immediately drove back to Jose's house and picked her up. I don't know anything. Don't be, watch your step. Say, let the What are we gonna do? Maria rode with her brother to the police station. The plan to arrest them separately had failed. And as exactly what we did want to happen, we wanted them separated from, from the get-go so that they wouldn't be able to talk. And what happened was, Jose told her, I'll take care of this, I'll do the talking, you keep your mouth shut. All the way into the station, neither Jose nor Maria spoke to the police. Carpenter was refusing to talk, so Jose and his sister were the government's only options. On February 24th, 1980, agents interviewed them separately. It was clear from the tapes that Jose knew about the murders. McGarvey told him they were going to prosecute Jose and his sister. The agent offered him a deal. Jose's testimony for Maria's life. She would get 22 years for conspiracy to murder. Now, if you want something, I want full immunity for me and my sister Maria. Jose insisted on immunity for both of them. Prosecutors were faced with a difficult decision. They suspected Maria had helped Engelman plot her husband's murder. They rankled at the idea of letting her walk free. But without the testimony of a witness, Prosecutor Ankney knew they wouldn't have a case. She deserved to go to prison, but we didn't have a case. If we didn't have somebody flip on the dock that night, we probably didn't have a case on anybody because we couldn't use the tape was not enough to make the, the dock. The tapes couldn't be used against Jose or Maria or uh, Bill Carpenter. It, what, it, they weren't saying anything. You couldn't use them without the person saying them. Uh, so we were we would have been dead in the water. I want you to tell them that the investigators felt trapped. They needed someone to talk if they ever hoped to convict anyone. Jose was their only chance. Without him might get off scot-free. The government 
was trying to build their case against a dentist who suspected of killing more than five persons in a series of murder for profit schemes. Investigators needed the cooperation of Jose Montoya, a close friend of their suspect. Jose refused to talk to get a guarantee of immunity for himself and his sister, the widow of one of the victims. If he made the deal, Prosecutor Gordon Ankney would be letting two conspirators to murder walk free. We gave him a pass and we gave Maria a pass and for both of them to testify against the doc. It was the only way we are going to prosecute the doc and make him. And although it wasn't a deal we wanted to make, it was a deal we felt we had to make. Jose told investigators he had known Engelman since he was a young man. He'd been involved in numerous business dealings with the dentist, many of which were illegal. Engelman believed the only way to get ahead in life was through crime. His motto was, always plan your crime from the witness stand back. Jose said he had heard about the shooting death of his sister's husband after the fact. Lieutenant John McCready remembers Jose told him his first thought was that Engelman had done it. The reason that he knew this is because he was associated with Engelman for many, many years and had information relating to other crimes that Engelman had committed. And he knew of Engelman's violence and that he had the capabilities of murder because he claims that Engelman had done several murders that he had direct knowledge of. Investigators needed to corroborate his own story. They would now question his sister, Maria Montoya Henderson. They wanted her to tell them how Engelman had drawn her into a plot to kill her husband. Maria said she had known the dentist all her life. She admired and respected him. Engelman trained her as a dental assistant and gave her a job, but she always had money for her. I have a suggestion that you might want to consider. One morning, as she was setting up, he told her he had a solution. Marry a man and collect on his life insurance. Well, that would take didn't so long for him to die. She'd have to wait a long time for him to die. Died before. Sounds Not so, said He would kill him. done a lot. I've, I've done it before. Just ask Jose. If I can Madison can County Prosecutor you. Donald Such Weber believes Engelman looked for a certain type of woman. Much like a child molester will know which children are vulnerable, Glenn Engelman knew which women would easily succumb to his plans. Maria didn't believe Engelman was serious at first, but she believed he wanted to help her. He's a smart guy. He's been through school and all over the world. Engelman was a professional and had an education, she said, and she trusted him. Each morning, they would talk about Engelman told Maria to marry a man who worked for a big company with insurance benefits. Once they were married, he and Bill Carpenter would kill her husband. Weber believes Engelman chose his male victims carefully. They had to be simple people with good jobs. The jobs had to have good death benefits. They had to be naturally males, and they had to be susceptible to being taken in by these black widow spiders that he put out to ensnare him. Yes, I had a picture of Paul, and he would ask about him, what he did. And Maria said Engelman seemed pleased when she told him she'd begun dating Paul Henderson. Is this the one? Yes, that's Paul. Paul Henderson. Paul worked for the phone company, which had generous oh, insurance benefits. Okay. It's okay. You get a man to propose any time she wants. Maria had known him since high school, and the two were soon engaged. And after they got married, she said that the doctor kept saying, stay in touch with me, Dr. Engelman, stay in touch with me because once you're in and you get these insurance policies, uh, all they need new policies or become beneficiary of the present policies, then I'll kill them. Maria revealed that Engelman and Carpenter started planning the murder as soon as she was married. Then, just before the couple's he first anniversary, you the dentist drove her out to the site and rehearsed it. Well, I mean, I it. 
The following Sunday, Maria talked Paul into going on a picnic with her at the quarry. She almost had to drag him there. trail to get help. Engelman surprised her. He told her to be quiet and calm down. Done. Now, go get help. Go. She felt that, that, that Engelman had committed all these murders over the course of 22 years, have never gotten caught. And she felt that if she followed his advice, followed his direction, the fact that he didn't get caught, she would never get caught either. And she, she believed that what she was doing was a way for her to get ahead. Your portion? He took care of it. Because they had both of them put it into businesses, like I said. Okay, in the end, Maria wouldn't take okay. the money. Her brother Jose handled all? the payoff to Engelman and kept the rest for himself. Their mother never got her help. Statement ends on February. 1980 at 4 a.m. With Maria's testimony, My investigators felt they had enough evidence to prosecute Dr. Engel oh, for murder. God. Now they had to convince the jury. I think we got enough. We got enough to trial. After two months of investigating Dr. Glennon Engelman for the bombing death of Susan Barnes, the agents finally had him in custody. The dentist's selfish pursuit of pleasure and money had left a trail of suffering in his way that spanned nearly three decades. His actual reason for killing people was the fact that he, he enjoyed the game. He enjoyed killing people and he enjoyed getting away with it. He enjoyed planning it. He enjoyed carrying it out. Uh, he enjoyed, uh, he particularly enjoyed getting over on the police and getting away with it for as long as he had. Uh, he looked at it like it was a challenge, like it was a game for him. He actually, you know, he killed people for sport. Investigators had put an end to the dentist's murderous spree, and prosecutors felt they had enough evidence to try Glennon Engelman for the four-year-old shooting death of Paul Henderson at a quarry outside the city. As Gordon Angley prepared the case, he struggled to establish the credibility of his witnesses, especially the victim's widow, Maria Montoya. I mean, we had a hard time with the fact that our key witnesses were all somewhat involved in criminal activity, and one of them, the key witness, was a woman who married a man to have him killed for insurance proceeds, which she got, and she was walking away, and that could create doubt or a problem in convicting anybody. In September of 1980, Engelman's first murder trial began in Jefferson City, Missouri. Prosecutor Ankney needed a witness to identify the voices on the tapes. The defendant's ex-wife, Rita, came out of hiding to testify. Now living oh, under an assumed name in the federal witness relocation My name's Rita Engelman. She was that carefully old. shielded from the media. I'm 39 years old. Portions of the tapes were played for the jury. And identify to the jury, if you can, any voices. Tapes that hinted at Dr. Engelman's involvement in the now, Mrs. Singleman, can you identify the voices on the tape? Yes, I can. Um, one of them is me. And can you identify the male voice on the tape? The male voice was Glenn Engelman. Glenn Engelman, the defendant? Yes. As the trial progressed, Glenn and Engelman took the stand in his own defense. Dr. Engelman, how can you explain the implied Anthony confession of homicide? To explain what he meant by having a homicidal intimacy with Maria Montoya. As Engelman began to explain, he started to become angry. That I had the capability of being involved in a homicide. I mean, thank you, you've answered my question. Would you let me finish this? Thank you, you've answered my question. His anger quickly built into rage. The jury saw a transformation take place. That's wonderful. His whole demeanor changed, and his voice changed. It was no longer the soft-spoken Dennis. This was a man who killed people, and you could see it in the courtroom. The massive civility fell and they saw the face of the killer. Engelman had seen his own fate. The 
taped evidence coupled with the testimony of Jose and Maria was enough to convince the jury. After deliberating for 55 minutes, the jury returned a verdict of guilty. Engelman was sentenced to life in prison. Back off. Everybody back off. His accomplice, Bill Carpenter, received 17 years. Back off. Back off. The dentist was also tried and convicted for the bombing death of Susan Barnes. He received another life sentence. Prosecutors believe they could link Engelman to at least three more murder victims. Justice demanded that they continue searching for evidence. Prosecutors suspected Engelman was involved in the shooting death of Allen and Velma Graham at their farmhouse three years earlier. They also believed he was implicated in the murder of their son, Russell Graham. But prosecutors had a problem. Someone else had already confessed to the murder of the son. Alan Jackson was sitting in prison when, in 1979, he confessed to killing Russell Graham. Russell Graham. Special Agent McGarvey felt the police had the wrong man. They were already convinced that they had the murderer you know, in Alan Jackson. Uh, it's at that time we provided them with some evidence, uh, with the tapes and some inconsistencies uh, about Alan Jackson's confession. Sergeant Dennis Cooper of the Illinois Department of Criminal Investigation drove Jackson to the place where Graham's body was discovered and asked him to show them where he had parked Graham's car. And he couldn't do that. He took us to Coleman's Plaza and he pointed to an area where he thought the car was parked, but it was completely on the wrong side of the building. Now police were convinced Alan Jackson did not know the Under a second interrogation, the story began to crumble. He said he'd been forced to confess. He claimed a corrupt police detective working for a quick promotion had given him the police reports on the murder of Russell Graham and threatened to harm his family if he didn't confess. With Jackson's confession discredited, the way was now clear to prosecute Engel and his suspected accomplice Barbara Boyle Graham for Russell Graham's murder. Barbara was the victim's widow. She collected a small fortune from her husband's life insurance policies upon his death. She was a very close friend of Glenn and Ingram's. If investigators were going to prove Barbara Boyle Graham was involved in the death of her husband, they knew they would have to make a deal. Detective Bob Hertz. At that point, we knew that we needed somebody who could tell the exact story. You know, you like to do that in any case through either victims, which we had none that could tell the story, witnesses, which we had none. So at that point, in order to tell the story, you have to deal with one of the participants. From the moment Bill Carpenter had been arrested, he had stubbornly refused to talk to investigators. Besides Carpenter and Engelman, the only other person implicated in the Graham murder was Barbara Boyle Graham. She was a free woman. Carpenter was their only hope. Prosecutor Donald Weber went out to the prison and made a pitch. He said, I'm the state's attorney in Madison County. We know that you were involved in the murder of Russell. And we're here to talk to you to see if you want to make a deal with us. Now, I want to tell you that I have the discretion to decide who gets the death penalty and who doesn't. Weber offered Carpenter a deal. He would not face the death penalty. In return for Carpenter's testimony, he could plead guilty to three counts of conspiracy to murder. The most he would serve was 14 years concurrent with his present sentence. Faced with the evidence, Carpenter turned on his old friend and Barbara Boyle Graham. He remembered first hearing about the scheme at Engelman's office. Barbara dropped by, saying she had met an oil refinery worker named Russell Graham. They were planning to get married, she said. Engelman advised her to take out more insurance on Russell than he would kill him for her. When Barbara married Russell, she knew that she wasn't signing a wedding certificate. She was signing a death warrant. 
she knew she was going to run up these small insurance policies and she knew that once she did that Russell was going to be murdered. She knew all that. Going into the wedding, she knew that there would be a funeral shortly thereafter. Carpenter went on to describe how he and Engelman and Barbara waited inside Russell's garage. Engelman shot Russell, then struck him in the head with a three pound sledgehammer. And, uh, this was a big up. break for investigator Dennis the car, Kuba. He opened the garage door. And, we uh, didn't know about Russell being killed in his garage. That was the first time we ever heard that. So we went back to see what we could do. As Carpenter described the slaying, there had been a great deal of blood. The investigators hoped some trace of it remained and that they could find it years after the crime. By this time, Barbara had moved away. Agents got permission from the new owner to examine the garage. They sprayed the interior with luminol, a chemical that reacts with blood proteins. The evidence glowed like a signpost from beyond the grave. No, On August 10th, 1989, four and a half years after Russell's murder, investigators located Barbara Boyle Graham on vacation in Lauderdale by the Sea, Florida. When officers arrested her, they found she was carrying her passport and was planning a trip to Europe. Still aware of what was going on in St. Louis and suspecting police were closing in on her, she was poised to leave the country. Special Agent McGarvey believes Carpenter's cooperation was crucial to putting Barbara behind bars. She was convicted of the murder of, uh, of her husband, and she was given a, a sentence of 50 years. She's now serving. Engelman had already spent five years in prison for the bombing death of Susan Barnes and the murder of Paul Henderson. He was serving 60 years plus two consecutive life sentences. He had not received the death penalty for his previous convictions, but the prosecution was seeking to sentence him to death for the murder of the Grahams. On June 19, 1985, he agreed to plead guilty to killing Russell Graham and his parents to avoid the death penalty. Engelman uh, actually explained himself rather well once. Uh, he said that a lot of people have various talents. There are architects, there are lawyers, uh, there are judges. He said he had a particular talent. The talent that he had was that he could murder with, without any remorse and in cold blood. And he felt that it was that inherent talent that he had to murder without remorse that would make him rich. And he proceeded on this course to make a business out of murder. Dr. Glennon Engelman's murderous business came to an end when he was caught and convicted of killing five people. He is suspected of at least two more deaths. Glennon Engelman died in prison in 1999 at the age of 71.